Welcome back. It's lap two and Formula One goes gothic this week with the cult on Backstage Pass. In fact, we interviewed Ian and Billy at the beginning of the 1987 tour while they were on stage at Brixton Academy. I'll be talking to Billy and Ian after this one, one of the early hits, Go West. The first thing we noticed was the elaborate stage check. Definitely an extravagant move for the band. So why did they do it? Especially honest, but um, before we had a very dark set. And um, I think that reflected, you know, uh, the fact we had no money. <laughs> now we've got a lighter set and it reflects the fact we've got a bit of cash. But, you know, we just believe it's it. We just wanted to put it in a really basic format. Um, just have a you know, basic thing with the amps and the drum kit and that. And we didn't want to go like build pyramids and all that sort of stuff, you know, and sort of, like, spacecraft coming out of the scene and stuff. We just want to have a basic set. I mean, the stairs and the, the runways at the top, they're just functional. You know, that means that maybe the people at the back will be able to get to see us. And it's good for working with, uh, you know, coming in the show, leaving the show, that sort of thing. So um, it's more of a, fun, it's a functional set. The Cult's last album, Electric, was produced by none other than none other than Rick Rubin, the Def Jam Supremo, responsible for the likes of the Beastie Boys, uh, Run DMC, and all that hip hop. Considering their style and reputation. We thought it was a bit ridiculous. We were so curious, we asked who suggested him. What suggested? Because he's a complete and utter blatant rock and roll freak. You know, he's, that's one thing that um, maybe people don't know about Rick is the fact that you take Run DMC, for example, what made Run DMC happen wasn't the fact they were not on their own, it's the fact they got involved with Aerosmith. The Beastie Boys, one of the most attractive things about them is the fact they're mixing rock and roll, things like Led Zeppelin and ACDC with when they're scratching and mixing the records, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's one of the things that Rick Stone has taken, like, hip-hop and fused it together with rock and roll. He was basically a rock fan, you know, and uh, that's why we got involved with him, because we heard mixes that he'd done a year, year and a half ago with the Beastie Boys. So that's what attracted us to him. As soon as we spoke to him, he just went, yeah, we have similar influences, so let's get together. And as it turned out, we went to New York, we started re-recording tracks we weren't supposed to be doing. And it sounded so good, we just decided to re-record the whole thing. And somebody had to foot the bill for it, and we don't care who it is or whatever. We just wanted to make a damn good record. Well, that's Wildflower, a track taken from the LP Electric. But does Ian think it sounds a bit too much like a hip-hop production? No. What it does, the thing that Rick has helped us to do is to strip the sound down to the basics, which is what we wanted. <clears throat> you know, it's got more of us in it. So all we've basically done is unlayered the guitars and unaffected the drums and the vocals to the great extent they were affected in the past. So it's just like a basic, raw album. And the songs really come through, you know, everything really comes through. It's a very powerful record. And that's it. Now we've found a formula and we'll continue to work with them. I don't think you can freak them out too much. I hope not, you know what I mean? It's like, no big deal. It's just a lot rawer sounding. It wasn't so uh, modern in its airbrush sound. You know, we just, everybody's record seems to sound the same nowadays. I mean, it's got a lot to do with technology. It's all like goes into a funnel. And whether it's like supposed rock, a like Europe and Bon Jovi, that's pop rock. It all comes out the like sound like Phil Collins. Well, yeah, it's that sort of airbrush thing. We just wanted to make a record that it's sort of quite nasty and abrasive on the ears. Well, we don't think it's very um, hip hop, so we wondered what sort of people go and see a band who are typecast as gothic, have white faces, and have their albums mixed by the same person as Run DMC. Everyone has been coming to see us for about two years, and it's like, uh, well, it's more of everyone, like this year. Even. I mean, for example, we, we played a couple of shows with Simple Minds in the summer. And um, we went down really, really well. And that was an audience who'd never seen us before, you know. And probably get a lot of their fans come to the shows. I mean, we do get, occasionally you do see sort of like 14-year-old girls with Duran Duran t-shirts and stuff like that. But it's mainly, I guess in the beginning there was a lot more boys, but there's a good balance between boys and girls, you know? all different ages, all different fashions, you know. That's it, we don't sort of say we are this sort of sect of people and we want this sect of people yeah, to just a lot, I mean, people can, you know, I mean, the way people dress, it doesn't necessarily reflect totally what goes on in their heads. You can, and, you know, you can't just, like, dismiss a human being as a heavy metal fan. I mean, that's what, they like music, you know what I mean? And that reflects a certain type of music, the way they dress. And a goth, I mean, what's a goth, you know? 
like so, like every goth lives in a coffin or something, you know, it's like... We get loads of them as well, kids. I would, I would imagine if you actually asked a goth what he thinks he is, I'm sure he wouldn't, the answer wouldn't be, I'm a goth. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a bit of a derogatory term. We still get loads of them. I mean, it's just like, people tend to want to dress up when they come to our gigs, which is kind of fun, making effort. <laughs>